Hello, you are now entering the infinite void. Hang on tight. We cannot save you now. Welcome to this week's episode. I'm your co-host, Jacob. And I'm your co-host, Matty. And this week's topic is Chaos Theory. So Chaos Theory is something that I absolutely love. It's just an amazing topic. And it takes some really quite simple concepts and just runs with it. And you get these amazing results at the end of it. So um, hopefully today's episode is going to be good. Uh, I'm going to be talking a bit about what Chaos Theory is, its history, and then moving on to look at some of the stuff sort of uh, funky stuff uh, that it does and some applications for it but i understand you've been sort of learning about it this week and looking into it yeah so you meant when you, we were like first discussing this podcast and like topic ideas and stuff and you mentioned it i'd like heard of it but i wasn't like fully in on it and from what i'd like learned or guessed about it was partly true but then it just turned out to have so much more to it as i've learned in the last couple of days but yeah i'm I'm excited because i can tell you're excited so i'm ready yeah. to do this yeah so i think chaos theory is one of those things that sort of in the last decade or sort of few decades has sort of become pop science a bit like quantum and that sort of thing so everyone sort of knows about it but not really what it is yeah. like, like, if you go online there's loads of books and articles and you see in newspapers and stuff so i think um yeah your sort of experience of sort of knowing just the small amount of it uh was sort of quite typical so hopefully mm. uh the listeners will get quite a bit out of today's episode as well yeah i'm excited yeah so yeah i guess we'll just start off with sort of what chaos theory is so at a very basic level so for people that don't know my sort of background is in physics so i did a physics um undergraduate degree and there's two main sort of schools of thought in physics. And that is, um, the first one is sort of a deterministic universe, uh, sort of determinism. So that is your classical physics, your sort of Einstein, um, your sort of Newton's gravity, that sort of thing. Yeah. So the classical thing that you see is a snooker table and you have sort of balls on them. Hmm. And the idea is, is that if you know the state of the system now, so you know where the balls are and how fast they're moving, you can say what the system will be like in the future. That's yeah. sort of quite simple, you know, um, or it, it, but in, equivalently, you could say what the system was like in the past. Basically the system now gives you information about the past and future of that yeah. system. So that, that's determinism. And then the other, um sort of school of thought is uh, a stochastic universe or a random universe um and that sort of has some underlying probability in it so that is your quantum theory so um in quantum theory you know things like electrons and photons these sort of quantum particles mm. don't have a well defined um sort of position even um, they're sort of defined by a, prob a probabilistic wave function so you can't say with certainty where something is you can just say there's a 90 percent chance that it's here and a 10 percent chance that it's there or something like that so knowing that the system now you can't be certain of what it will be like or what it was like yeah uh, that's the sort of other sort of thing we think about in physics um and then this is sort of where chaos theory comes in because i imagine sort of most people and i, I imagine that you were sort of saying was that you think chaos theory is random that there's some sort of randomness going on yeah so what i basically know about chaos theory is there's kind of two ideas really you've got the film aspect of it which was just more so like the idea of you can do something very minor that'll massively affect the future which is just like the butterfly effect mm -hmm. and then the other idea that if everything is random and everything is kind of chaotic it's weird that there's still certain patterns and things Mm -hmm. yeah so but that was kind of it for me so <laughs> yeah so so point number one of what is chaos theory if any point either of us says the word random in this podcast and says that chaos theory is random i want buzzers going off and red lights flashing all right that is simply not true Ch chaos theory is fundamentally deterministic it follows the physical laws of nature and it simply is a deterministic process. There's no 
probabilities. There's no randomness involved in this. All right. The the chaos you see comes from something else, um, which actually you just touched on was that small changes can cause um, you said sort of un unforeseen, sort of unpredictable outcomes. So this this is I think probably the biggest confusion for most people is they think chaos theory produces these weird sort of things. Oh, it must be random. Yeah, it's not random. It's just determinism that's unpredictable yes <laughs> so yeah I, I guess i'll sort of start with um sort of like where chaos theory came from and this idea of sort of small effects turning into bigger things will become extremely apparent so back in the 1960s there was a uh, meteorologist called edward lorentz and okay. he was trying to develop a Mod, uh, sort of a model for the atmosphere that you could use to forecast the weather. So he had all these terms in his equations of um, sort of humidities and air currents and things like that. Mm. And he man eventually managed to sort of simplify them to just three simple, um, simple equations that sort of relied on one another and had just three um, sort of parameters in them. Mm. And basically his most simple model that he was trying to use to model the weather was just a sheet of air with some currents going up and down in it. Yeah. That was what he'd sort of simplified it to. And anyway, this is like 1960s technology with the sort of old computers of the day. So he's put some numbers in, he's run them, and he's getting sort of some numbers out in a graph doing a thing. Yeah. Um, that's, that's sort of what he's looking at. And he thinks, um, I, I just want I just want to sort of run that data again. I just want to sort of look at that again. Yeah. But he didn't want to go from the very start. He wanted to go from the middle. So he says, okay, then I know that at this point in time, at this point in my sort of equations, these are the numbers. So he takes the numbers from his output that his computer's printed out and put those back into the computer yeah. and sets it running again. And of course, you know, if, if you think, oh, I've taken the numbers from the middle, it should just carry on as it was because these are just sort of deterministic rigid equations. Yeah, but and he, goes and gets, he goes and gets a cup of tea or something. He comes back and he sees that to begin with, yes, the system is sort of following what it did before. Mm. But then after sort of a few days of his sort of model, um, he was sort of modeling the weather over sorts of days or weeks, it started to just go completely weird and was doing completely different things. And he sort of investigated it. He thought maybe the computer was broken. But actually what it turned out was was that his readouts, the things that he had sort of taken and put back into the computer, I think were to six digits. Yeah. Where the computer was calculating to, I think, nine or 10 or 12 digits. Yeah. So basically the change in sort of the seventh decimal place and beyond so a change of like less than one part in a million, yeah. which he hadn't accounted for when he copied, copied the numbers over, had caused the sort of weather patterns in this very, very simple deterministic model to completely change yeah. um, after just a few days. And this was sort of where chaos theory began. Um, and this was, there were sort of things before this, but this was the first sort of case of it being studied and yeah. sort of written down in any mathematical form, I guess. Didn't his didn't his thing like create like on a graph like these like wild mm -hmm. like it kind of looks like an eight on its side but more like, yeah so squished so up. This, yeah so this is Lorenz's butterfly which is something I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to you later because right, it really cool. ties into something um, called attractors which if anyone knows anything about it, it will be like oh yes attractors they're cool <laughs> um, but yeah we're um yeah I'll, I'll come back to that remind me about that because that's right. sort of, it's really quite important but yeah this idea that you said of sort of small changes so these very small changes in the numbers he was using caused a really massive change in the like output of what he was viewing even though the equations are deterministic there's no sort of randomness involved in these yeah um yeah so so this is sort of the idea of chaos theory and i guess if you're going to define it in one sentence, it, you would say it's a deterministic event where small changes in initial conditions can cause dramatic or significant changes in the final or later conditions of a system. So, cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's that's kind of that's kind of like that's where my knowledge 
kind of finishes <laughs> on it now. But that's that's kind of the understanding that I had about it because it's kind of just how like how the like the present can like like to not determine the future, but like yeah, yeah. Well, it's, gonna... it's a it's a completely deterministic sort of model, and yeah. I, I think it's re- I think it's really fascinating that um, you can get these sort of massively different events from things that seem very very similar. Um, but yeah, so yeah. I guess. I, I I find it I find it pretty cool as well, just because like um, it kind of like another kind of way to kind of view it is like when you see like a lot of like sci-fi programs mm-hmm. and stuff, and then they talk about like multiple timelines and stuff like that, and yeah, you could yeah. you could see how like some of them slightly differ based off like circumstances as it keeps going and branching out and stuff, and it's kind of like a similar thing to that, but nothing to do with that. But that's kind of how my brain's keeping up with this one right now. <laughs> Well, yeah, there is there is a sort of a sort of wider context. You know, you can you can go down so many avenues of things with this. You know, yeah, you know, you, you can sort of start talking about things like free will and stuff. You know, yeah. So the sort of classical sort of physics arguments against free free will are that things are either deterministic and we're just sort of going through the universe as we have to, or yeah. that things are random and we can't control them. Whereas chaos sort of gives an idea that sort of depending on very very small changes um you know there could be massive sort of outcomes to things so um yeah you, you could take this sort of in many different ways and sort of interpret it and use it how you want to um i guess yeah but it's cool it's definitely it's definitely a cool topic for sure mm-hmm. oh, it, it really is so um yeah i guess i get with sort of chaos to find and i'll sort of move on to sort of the mind-blowing things that i love about this i'm ready so let's do it, it when, when you were sort of looking at the very basics of uh sort of chaos theory did you come across something called the logistic map i saw something about it but i didn't really read into it i'm not going to lie okay. this, is, this is gonna blow your mind man. This is... <laughs> so the logistic map is without doubt my favorite equation i love it okay it's a really really simple equation um but you can use it to model and literally see with your own eyes chaos theory so the logistic map is it's called um, an iterative equation so if i just define it for you now so it says that um x n plus one i'll come back and explain what the terms are x n plus one equals r times by xn times by in brackets one minus xn okay so it's an iterative equation which means that the out so you put numbers into it and you get an output and you put those back into the equation and keep iterating it over and over again so in that equation xn is your number you're putting in so the nth term you're putting in a number x um, and then on the other side of the equation, you're calculating the next term, xn plus 1. Okay? Mm-hmm. And then r in that is some sort of um, sort of growth rate, a growth parameter that you can tweak and change and do stuff with. So just to repeat that, the, the term sort of defined, xn plus 1, your next term is equal to the growth rate r times by xn times by, in brackets, 1 minus xn. And this is a, I, I, please, if anyone's listening, don't be put off by the maths. It really does not get much more complicated than this. Yeah, I was, was going to say, if anybody's listening right now and they're like, what the hell? I would highly recommend just Googling this equation quickly yeah, and just, and and just have a look at it because it makes a lot more sense. It's, it's, That's literally what I, I've just done right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I promise we won't go that where we would hopefully know more maths terms um, after this little point. But yeah, this this equation is fantastic because it is a very simple equation. It's got just one growth parameter and some num- a number that you put into it, and you get chaos theory out of it. So what you can do is is with this equation, think think of it like a population of rabbits. So these sort of sort of um, iterative equations are good for mapping 
um, sort of growth in populations. Yeah. And um, that's a, sort of what the logistic map does. Um, so think of a population of rabbits. Um, if you put in very few rabbits and you have a growth rate, then next year there's obviously going to be probably slightly more rabbits, but still not many because there's sort of no rabbits to breed. Is there? You know, you can't go from having two rabbits to a thousand rabbits next year. It's not going to happen. Yeah. And likewise, on the other end of the scale, imagine you have a million rabbits in a the field. There's simply not going to be enough food for all of them to eat. So yeah. your population next year is going to go basically Damn. almost as if most yeah. of them are going to die. Yeah. But in the middle somewhere, there's going to be some sweet spot where there's quite a high growth rate. You know, you go from having quite a lot of rabbits to a lot of rabbits sort of thing. Yeah. And then you can keep iterating that. So you go from quite a lot of rabbits to a lot of rabbits, and then they unfortunately die. So you go back to having a few rabbits and it continues to grow. You go through these sorts of cycles of growth. And how that will play out is dependent on that growth factor. Okay? Yeah. And you can imagine that for a population under a certain condition, there's going to be some sort of um, population that it stabilizes at. You know, it's, it's going to tend to a certain population. Yeah. Okay. So what you can do is, is you can map the end product of this equation. You iterate it over and over and over again. Where does it eventually tend to? Um, dependent on your growth factor R, you can change that. Okay. Okay. Sticking with me so far? <laughs> yeah, we're here. We're here. So the small values of R, when R is less than one, you can see you're timesing something by 0.5 or 0.7 over and over again. It's just going to go to zero. Your population is going to die out. Yeah. Your, your growth rate is less than one. It's not going to continue growing. Between R of one and three, if you set R to one and three, you get this behavior where you tend to um, a certain value. Your population will grow or shrink and grow and will eventually level out and get to some sort of fixed point, a sort of, um, it's called a, a stable condition that you're sort of growing to. Yeah. And, and that will depend on R, depending um, what you set R to. And then... At r equals 3, if you plot this, so you have your x-axis as r, you're changing it to go from 0 to up to 4, um, you typically do it too. Um, and on the sort of y-axis, you've got your stable condition where your system is tending to. At r equals 3, you get something really cool. You get something called a bifurcation. Um, and what that um, essentially is, is it's called a period doubling. So rather than tending to one sort of stable point, it tends to two points and oscillates between them. So is it kind of like a, not like a divergence, but like a split or something where there's like yeah, it's exactly, two it's exactly things? That. Cool. If, 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 you, if you plot it on a graph, sort of below one, it's just a zero, it's a flat line, and it curves up in a single line, and then it, the line literally splits at three, and yeah. it goes off in separate ways. So now your population of rabbits isn't tending to a certain number. One year it will go to, so let, let's say it's tending to 100. It's not doing that anymore when R is greater than 3. It will be 75, it will tend to, it will take a bit of time to get there, but it will tend to 75 one year, 125 the next year, 75, 125. And again, it's dependent on R. So the sort of two branches split. Um, and this is the sort of, first thing you think that's a bit weird like what why would yeah. this very this very simple equation up to now is just giving you an answer out is now doing something that is not normal and is a bit weird yeah yeah so we carry on we keep increasing that and at about 3.5 you get another split so now rather than tending to two um values you tend to four values yeah. so your, your rabbit population goes 80 90 110 120 80 90 110 120 or it, it could be in any order it doesn't have to be sort of increasing like that but yeah. there's some sort of oscillation going on here and then just beyond that you go to about 3.5 to i think 
it splits again and you get eight periods and then just after that it splits again and these bifurcations these splittings happen again and again and again very very close together until at 3.57 so your growth rate of 3.57 remember this is just the simple equation of yeah output out of a number at 3.57 you get chaos that is there's no repeated oscillation now it continually oscillate okay it doesn't oscillate it continually just flicks between numbers forever you know it, there's no yeah. sort of sing, single value or two values or four values that it tends to and this is weird this is very odd the, the, why this would happen yeah you know, this is actually a question that i don't think anyone's really answered why a system that is so simple would tend to something completely wrap up no not random <laughs> not random yeah into something completely chaotic is is really interesting question and i yeah i would say you know even just pause the podcast now for 30 seconds have a look at this equation and put in logistic map chaos on google images and you'll get this picture you're looking for like a single curve going up and it will split and get chaotic on the right hand side just have a look at this this sort of map it's a fantastically interesting thing. <laughs> so, have you have you got the image up in front of you? I've yeah, I've got I've got a couple up actually because I want to do a wanted to have them on hand just in case. But <laughs> so so can can you see the one I mean where you get this sort of chaotic behaviour on the right hand side? Yes. Yeah. yeah okay. So you see what I mean about the bifurcations? You have that period, you have that bit where you have two arms and then four arms. Mm. And at about 3.57, you just get, it looks solid because these bifurcations just happen like infinitely yeah. close to one another. Yeah. Yeah, so this this is a system going chaotic. And it's, it's really interesting. And I, I said I'll come on to some sort of applications and real life examples of this. But you know, it, it's always a very philosophical question about why something so simple just go chaotic <laughs> almost so quickly. Um, yeah. It's quite interesting. Yeah. So what what's your first impressions? What, what are you thinking about at this point now? <laughs> well, first of all, it's just like that whole, like those numbers are quite close together do you know what i mean like when you when i when you said it started at like three hours like oh, okay it's we're gonna we're gonna count up but like we didn't even get to four no and now it's like not infinite but it looks infinite in how many times it's like broke off i think it is infinite these these bifurcations happen infinitely close to one another and that's sort of again one of the weird things about it and yeah you said you said like so, so th this is the point of bring it back to what we said earlier about initial conditions sort of changing things so this now depends very very highly on what you put into the equation so yeah. when we were down below three and you just have one value or you had that area of two value you can put i'll say the the, the logistic map x is limited to between zero and one or else it just blows up sort yeah. of thing but you know, you could think of it as like naught population or a hundred percent population if you want. It's limited yeah. between zero and one. You can put in any value of x, and the system will tend to a certain value. It doesn't matter what you put in. It might take longer to get there, but it will tend to that value. Yeah. When you're in this chaotic regime, there's so many sort of arms in this output that it is very, very dependent on what you put into it. You know. When I was doing my undergrad, I actually ran some sort of models and simulations on this. And oh, fine, I can't actually find one. Um, you know, so I, I put in values of x equals 0 0.3, and then I think nine noughts on the end of it. And it follows a certain path. It, it's chaotic, it's going all over the place, but it's sort of doing its thing. And I put in 0 0.3, a load of zeros, and then a one. So this is like, less than one part in a hundred million yeah and all i'm doing is looking at what the value is after each iteration 
and it follows it per like from sort of my naked eye perspective it follows it perfectly for about 20 iterations no change and then at 21 iterations there's a very slight difference between the two systems where i put these two different initial conditions in yeah and then at 22 it's just slightly different and at 23 they sort of go off and do their own thing and by sort of 30 these systems are completely independent there is you, you wouldn't even know that they're the same yeah. thing that you're sort of looking at here so yeah th th this is the butterfly effect that you um said about earlier this so actually um so it's coming said um the flap of a butterfly's wings could start a tornado in texas or something like right across the yeah. world and this is basically what it's saying is that a very small change could have a massive impact sort of later down the line um and it has quite significant implications but, um yeah so let's carry on on our adventure up the logistic map there's just one more thing that I like to discuss. And if you've got the picture up, you can probably see. So for anyone that's not looking at the moment, you have this single region and two arms, four arms, and then there's so many arms that it just looks like a solid blob. But then at some point you get this window, this sliver. Yeah. This sort of opening in the logistic map equation. And that is where the system has gone back to not being chaotic. So at that very, very specific value of R, you're not having chaos anymore. You've got a system where there's three values that it tends to. So we had one value, two values, four values. We've now got a window where we have three values. And then there's another window just along, a bit further up along R, where you have six values and okay. nine values. And within this region, within this sort of equation, yeah, you've got this chaos, but you have infinitely number many of windows of all of these bits of non-chaos as well. <laughs> so th this this sort of thing just blows my mind, you know, that a system can start so simple, can go so weirdly chaotic, and then also have very particular windows of non-chaos in it. Is, is fascinating it's really really cool so my question to that then would be mm -hmm. could the universe at its nature be chaotic but we're just living in a time where it's not this is a this is an amazing question and the simple answer is yes so i said earlier about this sort of Edward Lorentz and his meteorology was one of the first things to see chaos. Actually, the first recorded observation of chaos was maybe centuries before this, when people were studying the motion of the planets. Okay. So in physics, you can map two bodies orbiting one another, you know, a sun and a planet. That is like very easy undergraduate level physics. You can... Yeah those calculations on the back of a piece of paper it's very very simple but then if you're put in a third body so this now becomes what's called a free body problem so you have the sun the earth and the moon or the sun the earth and another planet yeah it's a very small difference and you'd think oh, that's surely quite easy but this problem is fundamentally unsolvable yeah you cannot solve the free body prop you certainly can't do it on paper you can do some computers of simulations and methods that will do it very very well but it's fundamentally unsolvable so if you consider our solar system which has you know obviously a number of planets and then you know millions of other bodies on yeah. different sizes in it then yes the solar system is chaotic you know we, we on our sort of human time scales think of the solar system as being sort of almost fixed you know we're moving but things stay in their orbits and do their yeah. things occasionally an asteroid might sort of fly out and stuff but simulation sh sort of suggests that over the course of billions of years planets in this sort of multi-body problem just sort of get nudged ever so slightly they just sort of get influenced by others gravities yeah and 
you know, you get some, again, it, this, this chaos, you get systems where something looks ordered, it looks deterministic, but on long time scales, you have planets flying off out the solar system and planets yeah. crashing into things and doing crazy stuff. So yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. And, um, and yeah, that, that was one of the things that I was going to come back to later in terms of sort of applications and stuff, but, um, I guess we jumped the gun. Um, and it's always good to get back to space when we're talking about things on the podcast. So. <laughs> yeah. No, because that's that that was kind of like what I took from it mm-hmm. was just like the idea that because like when you do look at like the solar system and you look at pretty much everything, you you can kind of see a pattern, but maybe on like mm-hmm. long term scales. Because it's like we were saying even last week with like the Fermi paradox, like space is so big. And like mm-hmm. the time scales that we've been around to be able to like observe things and learn things is like nothing in comparison to like the age of the universe. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the yeah, I, I I appreciate the chaos. The chaos thing could be quite difficult to understand, particularly if you're just sort of looking at the mass and stuff. So, yeah, the things like trying to understand the population changes in sort of you know people always use sheep for some reason. Um, physicists love using sheep for that um <laughs> but yeah sort of these sort of planetary systems where you can sort of you can imagine what chaos would look like on long-term scales um the classic one is rolling a dice you know so again we'd think that rolling a dice is random that there's probability involved in it but there isn't really you know the dice is just following the laws of gravity and the friction of the table and things yeah doing what the universe tells it to and you know if this gets into sort of different problems of sort of uh, maxwell and stevens and stuff that actually if, if you could know everything about the dice you know precisely how you're holding it and um, precisely how you threw it and how the gravity affected it and the air resistance and all this sort of stuff yeah you could predict what the dice would land on but it's this idea of chaos that the changes just have to be so small that when the dice bounces, you know, if you roll a dice onto a hard table, it bounces maybe 50 times or something. Across those sorts of, you know, that's an example of a small time scale when compared to the, like the, the soda system. Hmm. But the changes, you know, just a tiny change in how you throw it or the sort of roughness of the table or something will massively affect the later outcome of it. Um, so yeah, a, di- a dice is deterministic, but it's chaotic, so we can't predict what it will land on. I guess. Yeah, it's almost it's almost kind of like without getting all like philosophical, but it's almost it's almost kind of like you're like in the fog, and you yeah. can you can see a certain distance, but then it gets too wild. That that that's exactly it. So yeah, that, that's basically it. And depending on what that distance is, is depending on will depend on your system and your, I guess, your sort of interaction rate. You know, when you roll the dice, things happen within milliseconds. It bounces, you know, yeah, many times in a second or so. Planets take years or millennia to sort of interact with one another. You know, you might only come across another planet in a particular orbit, you know, once every tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. So, but essentially, this is an iteration. You know, every bounce of the dice, every turn of the planets is an iteration in this chaotic system that is our life <laughs> <laughs> just everything we see yeah yeah you well we're we'll trying to avoid getting as deep and uh sort of philosophical as we did last on last week's podcast but uh, <laughs> you could you could quickly go down that avenue <laughs> yeah totally so, the, the other one is you know just as I said about Lorentz earlier, weather predicting. Even today, you can't predict the weather more than about a week in advance. Yeah, you you just can't do it. The system there's so many parameters involved in like atmospheric science that you just can't know. So that, that actually what they do is is they use chaos instead of just sort of saying, oh, here's the system, let it run. What's the weather like in a week? They make very very small changes to the system and utilize this chaos to give a range of values in a week. Yeah. So you put you put in 
very slightly different sort of initial conditions and say, okay, depend looking at what those initial conditions give in the future, we can say that the weather will be in this range of things. So um and of course if you start to do that on two off like a month's time scale, then the chaos again sort of takes over and you go from this place where you have sort of things that are a bit similar to things that are just completely chaotic and meaningless. So yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's really an interesting sort of area. And I I think it's probably an area that um has the potential to be utilized more. Um at the moment it's sort of this sort of bogeyman that people try and avoid and you know, even when I'm sort of doing my coding at work and stuff, you have to you do have to be mindful of what like precision MATLAB's working to and stuff. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think I think there's potential that this stuff could be of use, um, and I think we probably will be, uh, see it being used more in the future. Yeah. What, for what kind of what kind of things do you think it's going to be used for? Because from what I saw from the little bit of research that I did do, um, mm-hmm. it it exists in a lot of like natural systems, and then sometimes I saw it also kind of like spontaneously occurs. Um, occurs spontaneously occurs in like artificial stuff as well yeah so um to be honest, if if you've got stuff about the artificial thing that would be quite useful because i'll be quite honest and I say i don't um sort of know a lot about that but in terms of natural systems you know it's to be expected this is a natural phenomena of the universe um so the what the ones i know of is again these population growths actually do happen um, and we do observe them in um, the wild, I guess. Um, a really interesting one that I saw was on the heart fibrillations. So um, I, can't, I, couldn't, I can't remember if it was someone going into cardiac arrest or they had some sort of um, heart fibrillation, but the actual beating of the heart becomes chaotic. It follows the chaotic pattern. You, you can They sort of plot the sort of beating of the heart and it, literally looks like one of these <laughs> diagrams of the logistic map it's really weird yeah um, it looks identical to it um and you know that there's a potential if you know if we could understand the sort of chaos theory behind it then you could make a system that could more accurately um be used in a defibrillator to start a heart or something like that so yeah. it it yeah from a natural point of view it's it just seems to be a part of nature and you know potentially there's sort of application which which we can make use of it i guess so but what what about the artificial stuff did you sort of come across anything what you were yeah so it's it's not a lot but the two things that i saw that were like artificial or like kind of like man-made were Mm -hmm. like stock market predictions and then obviously like traffic predictions as well Yeah, yeah like it's quite hard to um they were saying like when it comes to traffic, it's not so much like predicting the traffic because they can obviously do it with like times and how many people are in the seas and stuff, but like mm-hmm. managing where people are going to be in the future. And if they're in their cars, it's like quite a chaotic thing as the further yeah. you go along. Because if people move from one place to another, it can push other people out and then has massive mm-hmm. like outcomes for the future, but not for the little places. Yeah, I, I can imagine the economy world would be quite interesting because that that's a system where you've got lots and lots of people and things going about, and it's happening happening very quickly. So I, I can I can see how that could quickly descend into chaos um, in a physical sense, not the usual financial crisis sense that we. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that, that, it, I, I think it's really interesting. Um, I'm sure you probably noticed I get quite animated about this stuff so <laughs> that's awesome you've you've been saying you've wanted to talk about this one for a long time so i've been excited yeah. for it yeah so I, th- I think we've still got time just for one final bit on this and it will wrap it up nicely and go back to what you said at the start about this butterfly about mapping this sort of butterfly and stuff so attractors um i did sort of briefly mention them and i said hold on to your hats it's going to get good um an attractor is please don't, again please don't turn off it will be very brief um is a mathematical object that describes what a system tends to so um in i'm nodding case, by the way if anybody okay. is wondering why i'm quiet i'm just 
I'm loving and <laughs> taking it in. So in, in, in that period earlier where I said it, it tends to one value, you could map that as an attractor. You have a sort of space and it's just going to curl in to one value and sit on that value. That's a, it's called a fixed point attractor. Um, and it's basically saying, think of it almost like a black hole, I guess, of maths. You put a system somewhere in that space, the space being, um, it could be the velocity and the position of the system or some of the parameters of the system. You put the system somewhere in that space. So you say it has this velocity, this position, and it will just curl in and tend towards a single value. Yeah. And then you get two fixed point attractors. So this is where you now have two of these sort of spirals sort of spiraled in one another. And depending where you put the system, it will spiral into one of them. And it's dependent on where that space in, in that space you start. The way that I, yeah, the way that I saw this is, I can't remember what they're called, but they had like those things that like, it's a really simple word and I don't even know what it's called right now, but it's like the things that just hang and then they like spun it and as it slowed down it went to its fixed point oh um a pe pendulum 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 yeah. yes yeah. that's the video i watched on it that explained what you're saying to me right now yeah. if anybody yeah. listening is thinking what <laughs> that that's the sort of classic one so just imagine a simple grandfather clock pendulum you can raise it at any point on either side of it and and, and at this point you're not talking about um sort of position and speed you're looking at the angle and the speed of it but you can you can lift it either way either side of it at any height let go of it and it will come back to rest at the bottom point that's pretty obvious right yeah that, that's a single point attractor that's a single point case that we're talking about the two point case could be easily thought of imagine you have a um you stand something up on a table you know, you stand a pen up on a table and you can move it slightly either way, can't you? So it's not stood perfectly upright. Um, you, let, let's imagine a pencil. A pencil won't stand directly upright, but you can pull it slightly to the left or slightly to the right. Depending where you put it, it will either fall to the left or to the right. So that, that's, a, that's a two point system. Um, that, that's the most basic one that you can think of. And these attractors are cool. You could do some interesting stuff with them. Um, but an important thing to say is that imagine you draw a spiral of it going into a point. No spiral will ever overlap with another spiral. Whether you have one point or two points, it can't happen. Because what that would mean is imagine if they over overlapped. That would mean that there would be some space, some sort of conditions, some uh, and uh, initial conditions you could put in that doesn't go to one of the points. Yeah, it, it could go to either of the points because the lines overlap. So that that's the sort of fundamental point here is that with these attractors, no point will overlap because, or else the system has a potential not to tend to one of those points. Yeah. So these are non-chaotic chaotic attractors. Very simple behavior, tending to one point, tending to two points. You can even tend to a loop. So rather than attending to a point, it just sort of cycles around a loop of values. And then this is Lorentz's butterfly. This is the butterfly that you mentioned earlier. If you now imagine a 3D space, so I said at the very beginning, you have three parameters that he was looking at to define his, um, his sort of forecasting equations. You plot those on three axes and you put these values in it. You just look at how they spiral and what they go to. Yeah. They don't go to any value. They will never go to the same value twice. So what you do is, and if you, again, if you just Google Lorenz's butterfly, you'll see this sort of beautiful butterfly pattern. If you put a point down and it produces this butterfly in three dimensions and it goes as it goes sort of around the attractors. Yeah, it uh, looks really, really cool. It, It's like a, um, yeah, it's like you said, it's like a butterfly or like a, a number eight on its side, but like stretched yeah. at the top and at the bottom. Yeah. So, so that Lorentz's butterfly is an attractor. So that is saying that if you put a system, if you put Lorentz's system at this specific value, it will continue infinitely along this path, along the butterfly path of just iterating over and over again in a chaotic way. 
and if you pull it at a slightly different initial condition it still looks like a butterfly you still get a butterfly out of it but the points never overlap you always get different sort of values coming up over again because again if a point occurred in more than one butterfly then that would be a point where the system is not well defined it will go to sort of either of two values so yeah um and yeah that, that i think um sort of wraps things up nicely we've gone from sort of what chaos is looking at uh, the butterfly effect and ended up with Lorenz's butterfly so um no any, any final questions i guess that was sort of all i wanted to say on it um not really i'm kind of a bit bewildered yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Because it's like it's like one thing as we were saying at the start on what I knew, and then like some of that is just like whoa. Mm -hmm. but... Yeah. Well... Oh, so sorry. Uh, I just remembered. This is, I think, the most interesting thing. Remember those windows I said about those regions of non-chaos. Yes. In the logistic map, there is a constant that defines the spacing between the windows. So you have a window and in your next window, the ratio of those distances tends to a constant. It's called, oh, I can never remember his name. I had to get it up. The Feigenbaum constant. It's about 4.8 something, I think. Um, 4.7, I think, something like that. And that's weird. That is just, there's no explanation for this of why a, a non-chaotic system becomes chaotic. Then you have regions of non-chaos, which are evenly spaced. Is That's odd. That, and, and the weirdest thing is it's not just the logistic map. So you can use other equations that are called single humped equations. The logistic map, if you map it, has a single hump on it. But a sine graph, for example, has just a single hump as well. You can use any of these single humped equations. They all have the same constant in them of the spacing of non-chaotic windows in chaos. That's... <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> It's it's very weird. So I, I, sorry, I cut in on you there. And that was just one final thing that I wanted to say. That no, that's that's cool. Yeah. So yeah, ho hopefully it's not been. I know. I appreciate this one was probably a bit more mathsy than some of the other ones, and we will take a break for the maths in future podcasts. Um, no, it's cool. Yeah. Ho hopefully, some of the stuff about the sort of systems and how it can be applied was useful as well. And people, yeah, just, just sort of take five minutes to just look at this stuff and um appreciate it i guess <laughs> yeah it's 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 pretty awesome and mm -hmm. they they look cool as well yeah they look cool uh, I, want, I want to get a print out i think i'm gonna put it on on the shelf i was gonna say if, if ever you want a uh, nice windows sort of desktop background just put in lorenz's butterfly or something it'll look nice That's yeah like... <laughs> it looks awesome it kind of without the this is dangerous now because I'm going to say something which it probably doesn't look like and then people are going to be like, oh, so that's what it looks like in their head if they haven't looked. But it kind of looks like a black hole merging with another black hole. In, yeah, in a weird look, way, yeah. the, like the line one. The one, I, <laughs> the one I've got up, it looks like a black hole simulation because it's even in that orange. But it's, they're like, yeah, it's like a butterfly, but it's like two like yeah. vinyl disc lines yes it's, it's got sort of two, two, two lobes to it um, yeah looks cool kind of like owl eyes as well yeah, yeah if, if, you, if you think it looks like that i was are you familiar with the mandelbrot set no the the picture of the frac the fractals where you have those lumps and if you, you keep zooming on it oh yeah, get... yeah, yeah yeah and it just ah. keeps going I, I won't go into it um Veritasium did a fantastic video on it if you just search sort of chaos Mandelbrot set, something like that. The logistic map equation is part of the Mandelbrot set flipped on its side. Okay. So so the Mandelbrot set, these windows in the logistic set are the bits of the Mandelbrot set where you have the bulbs and the little sort of balls that sort of zoom in and that's why the logistic map has these sort of infinitely occurring windows it's the mandel it's a part of the mandel process i can't remember if it's maybe it's flipped into 
like imaginary space or something it's, it's something like that but i watched that and there's a fantastic animation in that video yeah i feel it. like that it, would break my mind you, it's a fantastic animation of you what you start with a mandelbrot set and he, he turns it on its side and you see the logistic map chaos in it <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> it's it's really cool this stuff um well, I I will get that link off you, and we will share that on our socials as well. If anybody wants to, yeah, yeah, we we'll put it, it in the description or something. Yeah, but yeah, so yeah, that's all I think I have to say. So, shall we move on to sciencey space news? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, okay, let's do it. Let's get out of these topics. So, can I start with? one bit of news yeah go for it because this follows up really nicely on the topic of last week's show which was space debris and that is so this was um i think the end of last week um september 16th yeah the uk space agency has announced funding um for uk sort of startup firms to look at tracking and sort of dealing with space debris i actually um, saw something about this yesterday on twitter they had like a nice little animated ad on the uk space agency and they were like showing like how much funding you could get up to and stuff for your company yeah yeah so the the story i got in front of me is what they've given um what is it a million pounds to these seven sort of sort of they're quite small like there's fujitsu actually so they're quite a large company but they seem to be smaller specialized companies um, sort of focused on being able to track and monitor and analyze sort of space debris and develop sort of sensing technologies to do that. Um, and the BBC article I've got of um, sort of called up the big numbers that we discussed about there being 900,000 objects larger than one centimeter in size and stuff. So, um, yeah, I, th I thought that was just a bit of a coincidence that we were talking about that last week. And in the same week, the UK seems to have... Um, push towards some capability in that area so that was quite interesting to see i think yeah no for sure for yeah, sure but, um... I've, they've, they've got a few different projects going i think mm -hmm. i saw i saw they've got one for like solar one for like coastal like erosion i think mm -hmm. and then there's another one that they want to do for um emissions as well i think they're looking for people to develop the technology to put on satellites or something. I'm not really sure, but I've seen yeah. like some of the things that you can apply for and it looked pretty cool. Yeah. I think the UK space agencies, I think they're getting quite a bit of backing from the government at the moment to try and um, develop our own capability for reasons we won't go into. But <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. And that's, it seems like there's quite a lot of opportunities for people um, in that area at the moment. So it's nice to see. Sweet. Do you want me to go next? I've got one. Yeah, yeah. Let's have one of your pieces. So this first one is literally happened yesterday. And it's kind of in effect with what we were discussing today. I haven't seen much into it, but I thought it'd be a good thing to talk about. And it's basically Scientific American have got an article on computing and opinion today, or well, yesterday, and it's called The Quantum Butterfly Non-Effect. And it's a familiar concept from chaos theory, but it turns out it works differently in the quantum world, mate. Yeah, so everything we've just spent the last hour discussing and quantum takes over is going to be useless. So that's the, that's the uh, downside of this new story. <laughs> <laughs> so from what I've gathering is it basically says that uh, the butterfly is well accepted in our everyday oh the butterfly effect is well accepted in our everyday world where classic physics describes systems above the atomic scale but in the microscopic world where quantum mechanic reigns differently a very strange rule applies but does the butterfly still hold true well don't click bait me whilst i'm reading you out tell me the great bit of news <laughs> Um, it's basically saying that it exploits quantum entanglement and complex oh. evolution and 
it's something to do with quantum bits, but I'm already looking at that and it looks a bit. I think this is the thing with these these stories is they always seem to lure you in with just quantum. It's called quantum woo, just like this. Yeah, it's like the... the stuff that you don't understand but sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, have you seen have you seen that meme that the guy that's got the flexi tape when it's that leak and they always like. I don't know if you've seen mm-hmm. it. It's really funny. And it's just, it's like quantum physics. Um, well, no, it's like when we want to have a cool sci-fi story, but we don't know how to explain the science. It's almost yeah. just like quantum physics. It just slaps it on. Yeah, yeah. But. but yeah, this does ha- this is actually uh, quite interesting. So right, right at the start, I said that chaos is deterministic and works in this deterministic way. But we know that things below a certain level quantum takes effect and things aren't deterministic so e- even not knowing anything about the story um it it would be weird to think about chaos existing in that quantum regime um that would be quite cool i guess yeah because it's like it's even like the atom isn't it like a lot of people see the atom mm-hmm. as like this kind of like orbiting thing but isn't it more so like a probability cloud yes yeah, so like you... electrons like around the yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so fu- fun- fundamentally, it, quantum particles are defined by a thing called the wave function, which is just a field of probability. Um, and you know, we you, you might think of it around that and like a cloud, but fundamentally, it goes everywhere in the universe. And this is why you can get things of like atoms popping up and doing all sorts of stuff. You yeah, know, it, it it can be zero in places. The probability can be zero in places, but. Um, you have this sort of probability function that the the you know the, the quantum particle isn't a single point until you see it and it, it collapses, but it's defined by a sort of field of probability. Yeah, uh, maybe something we we'll save for another time. <laughs> yeah, because that's yeah, you've got like the double slit experiment and all that kind of cool stuff. Then, haven't you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna get off this article i've got one more but Mm -hmm. have you got anything else first um so i had one more which was just a bit of tech news Uh, i don't know a huge amount about it um and i've never heard of the company before but a company called volocopter which is a german company um has started announcing um and allowing reservations on flights on its um, electric aircraft. So this thing looks like, it looks the size of a small car, maybe a bit smaller than a small car, maybe like a smart car sort of size, but it's got a massive frame on the top of it with 18 electric um, motors. Um, So this is basically a personalized taxi helicopter thing that's electric powered. And um, they're saying that flights will take place within the next 12 months um, with some of these sort of early reservations and tests and stuff going on. And then they expect a commercial launch in two to three years. So that's pretty cool. This is sort of on the dawn of us all whizzing around in the sky in our personalized helicopters and stuff <laughs> that people dream about. Um, but yes, it, it seems to be sort of in. Um, it sort of seems like they're still in the sort of financing stage. They're selling the reservation ticket, uh, tickets. Uh, 300 euros can be reserved with 10, 10, 10% deposit if you're interested. Um, and there's a thousand of these tickets available and they say you'll be able to go on a 15 minute flight um, in this volocopter. Um, looks pretty cool. That sounds sick. Mm-hmm. So that might be one to look out for in the future. A volocopter. Mm-hmm. I'm just checking quickly to see if anything has come out for battery day for Tesla because they've got some big announcement. But I don't think there is anything yet on Twitter. I was just looking because for anybody listening, we're recording about half an hour into or after the announcement. I don't know if it's long or if it's short, but... Yeah, the rumblings are they're going to announce a million mile battery, but I don't know <laughs> if that's true. Well, but, I'm sure my Tesla stock will tell me once I 
check on that later. That's... <laughs> legit, legit. I haven't, I haven't wanted to check mine today because obviously <laughs> loads of people have been buying, so it's just driven it right down. But um, <laughs> did you, did you have a bit of a heart attack yesterday because somebody bought ninety million shares, didn't they, or something? No, ninety million worth in shares. I, I, I don't really follow it to be honest. I've got like fifty quid in it. I just stuck it there. But uh, so yesterday, apparently, somebody bought ninety million um yeah. like dollars worth in shares and it made it drop like the total share amount by like 70 and everyone was freaking out but <laughs> yeah so i guess next week we'll be able to tell you about the amazing stuff that got announced because we don't know yet but and, uh, unless things go particularly well and we're all millionaires so yeah you won't hear from us again <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, might, you might get an outro trailer <laughs> yeah but um no, that's there hasn't really been that much cool stuff. We've got some really cool stuff on the horizon though. Mm-hmm. With like the uh the crew one mission and everything, but we'll keep those when they get a little bit closer. Yes, it's a bit of a quiet one, um, news wise, I think. Um it seems like bigger things are happening. <laughs> yeah, the world is a crazy place right now, I mm-hmm. think. Yeah. But it's cool to see that even in all of the madness, some cool stuff's coming out. Yep, it's always nice to see. Um, oh, yeah. actually, just a add-on from last week. I don't know what happened with Nicola, and if we've jinxed them, I'm sorry, but it seems like GM pulled out and Trevor Milton had to step down. Yeah, so at the end of last week, I went on a bit of a fanboy talk about uh nicola being the next best thing and a week later they've um <laughs> it's not it's not looking good for them <laughs> which sucks because like any competition is good competition do you know what i mean and yeah it yeah, helps. Well, yeah the, the competition in the electric sort of vehicle market i was looking forward to and particularly their hydrogen capabilities i was quite excited about but from what from what i've seen a bit GM have pulled out, there's allegations or we, we say allegations that they sort of lied about their technical capability um, and there was some, I think, sexual harassment sort of reports as well going on yeah. and stuff, so um, it seems on economic technical and sort of HR front it's it's gone a bit downhill, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, obviously we don't know what is true and what isn't true as of yet but yeah it doesn't it doesn't look good no, but at the, at the very least the um yeah this this guy that sort of was the next elon musk i guess people sort of said about him uh being um has left the company so um yeah they sort of i guess we'll see where they go um it'd be a bit of a shame to sort of lose them just yeah, just the competition and stuff. But um... yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens now. Like mm-hmm. if they have a shake up and see what goes on down there. If they'll carry on doing anything that they were doing, or if they'll switch it up. If if I was going to put money on it, I would say that a normal car company would come in and buy up some of the technology. That's what I could see happening. Um, it it's it seemed to me. Like last week, I mainly sort of focused on the tech, but Nicola didn't quite have the gusto and sort of finance to really get this off the ground. So I said yeah. about that sort of interesting finance thing about sort of targeting trucks and stuff. If someone was to come in with a lot of money and investment, uh, that could speed it along quite a lot. So I, I could see that happening, um, but I guess time will tell, won't it? Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's it for this week's episode. I hope yeah. everybody listening at home enjoyed it. It was a heavy one, but it was definitely a good one. Um, we want to start hearing what you guys think about episodes and stuff. So if you want to let us know, hit us up on Instagram and Twitter at the infinite void pod i think yes that's it the infinite void pod (laughs) and then if you want to recommend some cool topics to us or want to send us anything cool that's kind of similar to what you've heard today you can email us at the infinite void podcast at gmail.com 
And that's pretty much it on the social front. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think we'll, uh, we'll catch you next week. <laughs>